Roberts is a native of Greenville, South Carolina. She holds her BFA and MFA from Alfred University. She has completed residencies at Anderson Ranch Arts Center, City and Internationale des Arts in Paris, and was a 2015 Wingate Fellow at the Archie Bray Foundation. Kate will be exhibiting at a ceramics biennale in Geneva, Switzerland this September, and currently she is a lecturer at the University of Washington. Please welcome Kate Roberts. I have to start by doing my Superman pose a little bit, just to get some, whew, okay. So um, anyways, I wanna start by uh, thinking a few of those who have not only given me life, but also, but have also changed my life. And um, that first begins with my mom and dad, who um, are here today. Uh, this is not their first rodeo at Enseca. They have been art critics, they have been art handlers, um, helping install work. And also my brother, um, who's here as well today. And then um, my husband, Alex, who um, has done a lot of hefty, heavy lifting in his life with me in the last uh, nine years that we've known each other and uh, from taking pieces in and out of a kiln to picking my heart up off the ground when I need it most. And then to uh, the teachers who have been there for me, um, who have kind of made me, push me forward, and that starts from my first high school ceramics teacher, Glenda Guyon, um, and then continued on to Alfred University um, that I got to spend six years out of my life with an amazing individual, amazing group of people um, Walter McConnell, Linda Sikora, Wayne Higby, um, Ann Courier, and then John and Andrea Gill, who have um, opened their doors to me and invited me into their lives. And then to my current colleagues that I have at the University of Washington, um, who are continuing to be my mentors, uh, Doug Jack, Jamie Walker, Mark Zirpel, Ami McNeil, and Michael Swain. So thank you so much. All right, let's get this party going. So in May 2010, I was a week away from presenting my BFA thesis show. For a year, I had dedicated my time and research to investigating a slump body porcelain slip that was piped out of cake decorating tube that I would then use to create dress forms. I engineered sets of molds and a way to sp suspend each structure. I had it all planned out. There would be three dresses each representing a character from the novel Gone with the Wind, installed like life-size dolls in the gallery. This research came from a need to push the ceramic material to its limits, as well as to understand how these delicate qualities could discuss centuries of women's struggle with the issue of appearance versus reality. How far could I push the idea and the case fragility to the extreme? With one snap, the whole piece could unravel and fall. And for two dresses, it did. I spent a week literally and figuratively picking up the pieces, deciding to finish building the dress with chicken wire that had already been a motif in the piped clay panels, and also trying to figure out how to move on in this presence of what felt like at this moment, this monumental defeat. For months, I couldn't shake this feeling that it failed. Around this time, Brene Brown's TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability, was sweeping the internet. She discussed how the birthplace of creativity is vulnerability. In her book, Daring Greatly, she says, vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat. It's understanding the necessity of both. It's engaging it, being all in. The events that shaped my BFA thesis were pivotal in how I approach making. Part of my practice since then is being all in. This comes in the form of being naive, taking risk, and not settling for what is known. Every time I begin a new piece, I like to pretend it's the first time I've touched clay. I try to be vulnerable. I fell in love with the material at a really young age. It's, it's just dirt, but its ability to be manipulated into anything has kept my attention. It can be hard, soft, rough, wet, vitreous, and all of these qualities can come together to make a beautiful piece. The medium walks the line every time we put it in the kiln. These failures that happened during my exploration become experiments. 
they often give me more information about how I can manipulate the material to emphasize its limits and its imperfections. Growing up in the South taught me about imperfections. According to fellow Southerner photographer Sally Mann, she says, we Southerners, like Proust, have come to believe that the only true perfection is a lost perfection. Buying into our own myth of loss by creating a flim-flam romance out of resounding historical defeat. We live between myth and truth, between appearance and reality, between life and death, and between the past and the present. It, it's hard to find a Southerner not in love or haunted by the past. Time does not move in a linear fashion, but is suspended, much like the humidity of the South. In, more, in my work, I try to find that moment in between, and that's where I think romance and beauty are born. I investigate these moments in between by using elements that allow the work to teeter on the edge of viability. In the series, The Study of Figures, I explored the ambiguity between qualities of accumulation and deterioration, solidity and transparency, entrapment and protection. As you walked around the space, the work became confrontational in its relationship to your body. Materials further altered the forms, piling on top of each other, filling in crevices. Within this figure, I wanted to imitate the Spanish moss I had seen during visits to the Low Country. I wanted you to question the strength of a cage by creating an attention with the physical weight of the compounding materials. It is the contradictions in materiality and meaning that I hope remained after viewing the installation, that you reside in a state of constant suspension in the in-between, neither whole nor non-existent, that this experience could become hauntingly visceral. One of my goals in creating is composing a piece in such a way that you feel it through osmosis. I believe, though, that this is one of the hardest things for an artist to do, to turn something completely ephemeral, such as an emotion, into something physical, and in turn, to make the viewer feel it. I find inspiration in the compositions of dancer Martha Graham. She wanted her dances to be felt by the viewer. The piece Lamentation is about a grieving mother. She represents ephemeral feelings of grief by contorting her body that is wrapped in a stretchy cylindrical form. Within my own work, I also seek to create a piece that is affected by emotion. What if emotion becomes too physically demanding for the support? What does that in turn look like? And also, what does it look like when the interior is gone and the shell remains? In the piece containment, fiber dipped in slip overlays reclining figures, much like a blanket draped over a form. The hollow form is suspended by what once was. Though the fiber preserves the shape underneath, its unfired state alters the shell's inherent quality of permanence. Though still standing at any moment, it could collapse. I look for these vulnerabilities in the material of clay, especially in its unfired state. As I build with fiber dipped in slip, the weight of the material naturally makes a line droop, echoing a feeling of submission. I see openings where pieces break apart in shipping, as spaces for the viewer to pause, contemplate, or enter once again into a space in between. Sometimes when I'm making, I like to leave little notes to myself to keep looking beyond the surface. In the South, the humidity fogs the mind. There is no energy to look any deeper. We get caught up in what we initially see, so we forget to look much further, to really research an area. I chose to have my graduate thesis show in a decaying post office in the neighboring town of Cornell. I studied the surfaces with an intense desire to understand how they became what they are. The floor of the largest room was uneven due to water damage. With that in mind, I created puddles that appeared to be slowly moving in one direction. I used pieces of debris collected from my studio to prop up the surface as well as to suggest a sense of movement. As people walked around the pieces on the ground, there was a tension in the air. One misstep and the stillness could cease to exist and then what was underneath would be revealed. 
Nature has always played a key or leading role conceptually in my work. I grew up in South Carolina with kudzu everywhere. I find it to be beautiful despite its ability to completely overtake anything in its path. There's a push and pull between nature and humanity. I love the similarities between the softness cast by the invasive plant and the inside of a decaying theater in Detroit. Though made out of different materials, both exude a vulnerability, a moment of release. There's a simple vase of dead flowers that has traveled with me from studio to studio. Over time, the remnants of the studio have gathered on the dried petals. Webs have stretched from one surface to another. I'm captivated by their final position. It reminds me of the pause just before the lights diminish at the end of a ballerina's performance. Topiaries are iconic of palaces and mansions. By altering their appearance with accumulated fiber and slip, it's a reminder for me that nature does not discriminate. Items symbolic of wealth, status, and grandeur are not safe from nature's wrath. The fiber hangs and wraps itself around the flowers and vase, trapping remnants of life. For the past year, I've explored the limits of clay in its unfired state. The pieces Port and Grand Port were further explorations into the role nature plays. By leaving the work unfired, I questioned its permanence. The gate no longer has the ability to contain or protect its vulnerability unmasked. In making these large installations, I've enjoyed the ability to make decisions not just intuitively, but instantly, to be able to respond to each mark in the moment, and for their temporality to keep each action from becoming too precious and in turn being more fresh. Like I mentioned before, Every time I try to, I begin, I try to pretend it's the first time I've touched clay. I do this out of curiosity. However, it doesn't come without uncertainty. My professor and friend, John Gill, would always say, just date it. You don't have to marry it. I'm also comforted in reading about other artists who find themselves in a similar situation and the way they confront these moments of vulnerability. Sally Mann takes the advice of an early mentor. She says, you have two choices. I can resume the slog and take more pictures, thereby risking further failure and despair, or I can guarantee failure and despair by not making more pictures. So in early January, when I started working on an idea that had been brewing in the back of my mind and the first print looked a little like this, I remembered those two choices. And I remember Brene Brown, who quoted the great Duddy Roosevelt, who said, credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust or clay and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. I see vulnerability as the way I can challenge this medium of ceramics, to be relevant and stay relevant. For I find relevance in failure just as much as I do in success. For me, it's also about being conscious. In making, I try to be conscious as well as to make the viewer conscious, to be aware of their surroundings, their choices, their being, and how it affects everything. Because to quote Sally Mann for the last time, living is the same thing as dying, and loving is the same thing as losing, and this does not make me a mad woman. I believe it can make me better at living and better at loving and just possibly better at seeing. The arts have the power to do this. They can make us see. Thank you so much for listening and for being a community of seers.